Yeah, if everybody is headed back. We got fingers pointing here. Oh, that's just the birthday. How about any, anyone else? Did you have a birthday? Oh, okay. When you get older, you won't be doing that. <laughs> All right, let's sing happy birthday to this young lady here. <coughs> anniversary we have anybody's had an anniversary no anniversary all right if you would take your song books and stand turn to page 259 page 259 stand as you sing Jesus saves <clears throat> page 259 on Sunday and we sing the song and one of the last things this song says is shout salvation full and free highest hills and deepest caves this our song of victory Jesus saves and we come in and shout and praise God for that but I wonder how many of us go out and actually do some of those things hey it's worth shouting about amen not just in the house of God but out now, last time I checked you can't get on a mountain peak in, in, the, in the low down church over here on the, on the main ground and start shouting Jesus saves I know this a man was walking through a apartment building and he said these walls are so insulated you won't hear the next door neighbor I've heard of some churches like that <laughs> they're so well insulated they speak a lot about the things going on inside but they won't carry most of that stuff outside we're to go out and win them amen we can shout about it here but let's shout about it out there we've got something about it to shout with praise the Lord amen brother Keith Preston we open our service in a word of prayer brother may be seated. Welcome everybody. I, I just when I think, I, I sit home sometimes and people talk about on television, and not that I have TV, but they talk about on television about sports and all this stuff going on. Y'all seen some of the clips of these people going out to the football game sitting in six feet of snow? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, out, out there they're, they're bundled and covered up. They bought the ticket. They got to go. 
And they get out there, and the, and the cameras are rolling around the stadium. They're shivering with, with, I mean, close to frostbite. And they're out there hooping and hollering about their favorite football team because they take a ball and cross the line like this. Woo! Boy, it's something to shout about, isn't it? And then it just when you start to think, well, it's raining outside. I wonder how many people are going to show up to church today. And here you all are. And I just got, I mean, it just feels like I've got a jolt in my heart. Amen. It's a blessing. You know that even a dog will get out in the rain if he's hungry enough and get wet for some food. You know what they say about a Christian that comes to church on a rainy day? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is wet. Amen. <laughs> but we're here. It's an encouragement. And I thank God for it. I tell you, look, here comes one right now. Amen. Watch this. What do you say, brother? You're, you're coming in. It's wet, isn't it? <laughs> Pray. Hey, you know, our neighbors must be thinking, these people are crazy walking into that building over there thinking they're going to get something. They don't realize, even though it's raining outside, it's sunshine in the house of God. Amen. And I praise the Lord for that. It's an absolute blessing. I, I mean, you all have so encouraged me this morning. I thank you for being here. I, I want you to do me a favor. I prayed for you all last night. I said, Lord, prepare the hearts of those that are coming. Well, he certainly did if you all showed up today in this weather. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Before the service starts, I want you to say a silent prayer for me. Pray for me, please, that the Lord will meet us. The Spirit of God will use me as a way to feed you all. We talked about being fed this morning in Sunday school. My obligation is to feed you the Word of God. Now, some people, Brother Preston, read that Bible, and they turn their churches into soup kitchens. And they start feeding God's people. Well, that's okay, but we turn around with the church, and we look a lot like Esau, selling our birthright for a bowl of soup. I know this, that Jesus Christ preached for two days, and then before the crowd left that had gathered, then he said, now let's feed them. Didn't have much to give, but he blessed it, break it, and they still had some at the end of it. Amen. But sometimes I wonder how many people would come into the house of God hungry and not ask for a bite of food, but say, thank God for that eternal food which was fed to me this day. Matthew 6, 33 says, take no thought to what ye shall eat. People come in the house of God and think it's the church's responsibility to give that consideration what they should eat. Well, my responsibility is to make sure that you get the word of God this morning. And I cannot, I cannot do that unless the Spirit of God helps me. So I hope to feed you this morning, amen, but not me, but through the Lord and through his word. And it's just a real blessing. I have uh, something I'd like to share with you all real quick. There are times in your Christian walk of faith that uh, you have doubts and you feel like giving up. And that's natural. It's okay to feel that way. That old song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. But then the next verse says this, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Poetic words that reach deep into the, the soul and the word of God and just excellent words to lift you up and encourage you. But somebody asks the pastors at times, and some of you old former preachers in here are pastors, you all know what this question may be, but do you ever have doubts? Yes, I do. And I'm not afraid to admit that because the part of doubting is the flesh, but the part of being uplifted in the spirit of God and the truth is the spirit. Amen. And we doubt and we have hard times and it's difficult. When, when somebody asks me, however, how do you maintain the course and how do you stay so excited about the Lord Jesus Christ and how do you know for sure that it's truth? There is a situation that I have come in my ministry and whenever Satan does his best to aggregate the fields of doubt within my mind and my heart and my soul, I'm always reminded of the works of the Lord. I'm just going to let you know, whenever you feel doubt, just remind yourselves of the works of God, not how you feel. Your feelings will lead you astray. Let me try to put this in perspective. The Bible doesn't say when you're born again, you'll feel saved. It says you'll be saved. Let me express this to you. I live in America. I don't always feel free, but I know I'm free. I think. You can't go based on your feelings. And I would love to give a lengthy answer to this, and I'm going to try my best to summarize this, if at all possible. But when somebody asks me that question, I always want to say, I don't ever have to look very far for more hope and for more encouragement. I can usually look about nine rows back. Somebody says, what do you mean, Brother Joe? About a year ago, I lost a dear friend the Lord saw fit to take him home to glory. Beautiful young man with a, just a... I remember when he first walked into this church, I watched him stride from the car to the back door, and I had to get up out of my desk to go shake his hand. And I said, my name's Joe. What's your name? He says, my name's Mike. And he just radiated. And uh, I got a phone call about a year ago, and the Lord had taken him home. And whenever you have those doubts that assail and fear captures you, you look around at the Lord's work, and you'll be reminded that he can do anything. The Bible says in Matthew 19, 26, with 
man, this is impossible. But with God, thank you, brother. What is it? All things are possible. So what do I mean when I say nine pews back? It used to be that uh, Mike and his mother would sit about nine pews back right over on this side of the church and attend faithfully to the services. And, uh, I went down and, and preached his funeral a year ago. And I asked Brother Brown at the funeral home, I said, Brother, do you have a room that I could go and pray? Because you think to yourself you're in a position of impossibility because you're trying to give encouragement to a world that needs encouragement, but most people have never heard the word of God. Jesus Christ, even in the book of Revelation, said he'd rather you be hot or cold and lukewarm. We just got a lukewarm nation of people against God. And there's not much you can do. People just stare off into space when you're talking about the eternities of life. But nonetheless, I got on my knees and I prayed and I begged God for help that day. And did he ever reach down with the wind of the spirit like fire and consume that building? And I preached that funeral and there were three people that got saved that day at the funeral home. And I bawled like a baby. And I stepped back and watched what God was doing and then through those people, those marvelous people there, and I thought this is only by the grace of God. So what do I mean when I say nine pews back? Nine pews back on this side of the church, there is a fabulous family that are seated here because of that eventful day. And one of which is born again Christian. It was his brother, Jeremy whom I have had the privilege to know, and we had lunch this week. Marvelous time with you, Jeremy. I thank God for what he's done in your life. But I never have to look far, John. All i got to do is look back at that family and see what God did that day. And my heart is restored to its fullest because I don't look at man and I don't look at anything but the works of Almighty God. And they have faithfully attended in church services, and they have been regular in their attendance. And, uh, John, I'm going to exchange the same compliment that you gave to me on Monday I really, really appreciate you and what you have done for me and your friendship. You mean so much to me. And I thank God for your faithful attendance here in this church. You give me far more encouragement than you'll ever realize. And I think it'll only be found as we pass over into that great glory land. But I have a, I have a poem that I'd like to read. If I may, real quick, I, I find it fitting, and I pray this will be an encouragement for you all. <laughs> My hiding place. Hell sovereign love, which first began the scheme to rescue fallen man. Hell matchless free eternal grace that gave my soul a hiding place. Against the God who built the sky, I fought with hands uplifted high, despised the mention of his grace, too proud to seek a hiding place. Enwrapped in thick Egyptian night, and fond of darkness more than light, madly I ran the sinful race, secure without a hiding place. But thus the eternal counsel ran, almighty love, arrest that man. I felt the arrows of distress and found I had no hiding place. Indigenous justice stood in view, to Sinai's fiery mount I flew. But justice cried with frowning face, this mountain is no hiding place. Ere long a heavenly voice I heard from God's own holy precious word. He led me in his matchless grace to Jesus as my hiding place. On Jesus God's just vengeance fell, which would have sunk a world to hell. He bore it all for a sinful race and thus became their hiding place. Should sevenfold storms of thunder roll and shake this globe from pole to pole, no thunderbolt shall daunt my face. For Jesus is my hiding place. A few more rolling suns at most shall land me on fair Canaan's coast, where I shall sing the song of grace and see my glorious hiding place. I know today's a tough day for you all. And the Bible says there's a time to weep, and that day's today. But praise God, just after that, the Bible says there's a time to laugh, and that, may, that day may just be tomorrow. I thank God for you all. I really do. Melissa, Debbie, Charlotte, John, all of you. You're such a blessing. I feel, I feel bad that I, I did not give God enough credit and faith to know that he could have done this, but he revealed that to me. So therefore, whenever somebody asks me, how do you maintain the course of faith, I never have to look further than about nine pews back.
Bible says we weep not as those that are without hope. And one thing I love about what the Bible has to say about tears is it says that God himself will wipe the tears from our face. You ever thought about that? God's going to give that his personal attention. I'd be just right if angels would do that. But you mean that God's going to do that for me? And one day after he does that, I'll never have to shed another tear. Once the hand of holy God rubs the tears off my face, and my glorified body, I shall never shed another tear again. Amen. So you all just remind yourself that God's going to give those tears his personal attention. And this young preacher thanks God for you. I really, really do. You all pray for that family. Matter of fact, I'd like to have a prayer for them real quick if we will. And I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Brother Chuck Willis if you'll say a prayer on behalf of the family this morning, brother. Y'all take your bulletins out with me real quick. I want to go over a couple of things here. And as you're grabbing those bulletins, I have to share this this morning. I was walking through saying hello to some people from the Sunday school, and I got back here to Sister Patty. And I said, hello, how are you? She said, I'm okay. She said, I fell in the dishwasher this week. <laughs> Boy, I sure am glad you didn't stay in that dishwasher this week. <laughs> Good. I don't know how you end up in some of the places you fall into, Sister Patty. I'm just glad Brother Tom's there to get you out. I would just like to be there when he walks the corner and says, What are you doing? I fell in the dishwasher. Bless God, I tell you what, my soul. A couple things real quick. Don't forget, men, uh, we've got a building committee meeting today right after the service, and we're going to have a little food for you all. Praise the Lord. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God has to do with or has us to do with that. And for those of you that aren't aware, our church is currently undergoing... Um, so much blessing from the Lord, and we're growing so quickly, and that's, a, that's just, shout. I can shout and praise the Lord for that. It's just wonderful, isn't it? And I thank the Lord for it, but I believe the Lord's got plans for us to do something with the new building, and uh, we don't advertise that a whole lot because the most important thing is what we're doing here as far as the gospel goes. Listen, if the floor caved in and the walls fell out, we'd put a tent up, and we'd, we'd be in the rain preaching the gospel, amen. It's not about the building, but it's a blessing when God blesses you with those things, and he gives it to your account, so we're going to do our very best to find out what the Lord would have for us. And right now, currently, we've got around $147,000 in that account. And we're looking to, uh, hopefully, it'll reach around $200,000. And we're looking at breaking ground on a brand new building for Brooks Baptist Church. And we couldn't be more excited about what the Lord's doing. But hey, even if not, if the Lord comes, amen, and, and he doesn't tarry, and we're going to go home being glory. And somebody says, what's the point of getting all that money? So the Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We'll work till Jesus comes. Amen. That'll be all right. So we've got a nursing home outreach next. Uh, that's next Sunday, right after the service at 1 p.m. at Bluegrass Assisted Living. You all have been so faithful in attending those. You, you just don't know how much that means to those residents there at the, at the Bluegrass. And if you all have been, we've had really good fellowship with them, haven't we? It's been marvelous. So if you would like to attend, it's right behind the new movie theater over by Dolphin Hill where the Kroger's and everything is at. If you'd like to come, please feel free to be our guest. We'd love to have you there in fellowship. And then discipleship class every Thursday evening at 6.30. We did cancel this last week. We had a lot of cancellations, but looking forward to picking that right back up this coming Thursday. Outside of that, we got our verse of the month on the right-hand side. It's Matthew 6, 28 and 29. We're going to say this three times together. So if you'll follow me, Matthew 6, 28 and 29. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Matthew 6, 28 and 29. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, for they grow, they toil not, 
neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. One more time, Matthew 6, 28 and 29. Brother, let me go and come forward. We'll take the tithes and offerings this morning. And I'll ask Brother Tom if you'll say a prayer for those tithes and offerings. Take your psalm books once more and stand, turn to page 66, page 66 at Calvary. <clears throat> stand as you sing, page 66.
my guilty soul with glory turn to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burdened soul for liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation brought it down to man Oh, the mighty gold that God dispensed at Calvary Mercy that was great and grace was free There my burden soul for liberty at Calvary Last verse Now Just give me 
Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Sometimes I read the writings of Paul and I think, Paul, how, how, how is it that you have such a touch on your life that you can write things like you write? And I know the Spirit of God was moving in and through him, but that man had a relationship with God and there was no doubt about it. When a man comes into a church and tells the elders, this is the last time that you're going to see me, and they kiss him and hug him, that means they meant something. He meant something to those people, those fine people at that first church over there in Ephesus. And I... I heard a man say this recently, and I think that it bears great truth. When you're gone, there are two things that the brethren will feel, and it's kind of humorous, but in a way it, it'll kind of shock you and wake you up. They're either grieved or relieved. And they were grieved at Paul's departure. But I tell you what, I, I think after gleaning through some of this tremendous book, The Living Word of God, I'm convinced that Jesus isn't all you want until Jesus is all you have. And then when Jesus is all you have, you'll never want the world again like you did before. I love this book. I know there are some churches that have a desire to read some other books or dive into some other material, but when Peter said, Thou hast the words of eternal life, I think we ought to just stick to what God had put down on paper. Amen. We don't need more book reviews from the pulpit. We need somebody to stand up like a prophet and relegate the scriptures to the absolute truth that they are. Amen. Amen. Somebody says, that's a little too old-fashioned. Well, God says, I am the Lord God, I change not. Amen. Amen. Dr. Vance Havner once said, we don't need anything new so much as we need something so old to be new. If anybody should try it, God's not running an antique shop. He doesn't need us keeping up with the accords and trying to create some fancies for, for people to come in just to be entertained. You all don't need more entertainment. You can go to the gas pump, as I mentioned, I think on Wednesday, and get that. they got screens on the gas pumps now. You don't need it in the house of God. I'm not saying the man of God shouldn't have some energy and smile and enjoy the fact that he's reading from God's Word. That should be part of the preaching. But it ought to be on the respect of the people's end to say, this is God's Word, amen, and what a blessing that is. I'd like you to take your Bible to the book of Luke, if you will, in chapter number 4. <sighs> chapter 4, I want you to kind of keep a mental note or a finger in verse 38, but looking over in verse uh, chapter 5, I'm going to read you several verses, and, I, and the context is going to be in 38, we're going to kind of, we're going to move to another book here, but I want to reveal something to you, and I, I really enjoy the life of Peter. I think outside the Lord Jesus Christ and Saul himself, there may have not been a better preacher of the gospel than Peter. And I tell you, had we been a part of the apostles to which Jesus Christ chose in and among that company, you and I wouldn't have picked Peter to lead the charge. It wouldn't have been our choice. It just wouldn't have. But nonetheless, as some people like to relegate that God works in mysterious ways, I think he works in deliberate ways too, amen. God was deliberate about his choice. He saw something in Peter. And what I love about it is somebody once said that Peter was the most American of all the disciples. I think there's some truth to that. But over here in chapter 5, in verse number 1, the Bible says, you got your Bible with you this morning? Amen. Open it up. Let's read it together. Amen. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, and the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which 
which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust him out a little, out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon, you got to understand, if, if, you're, if you're, you're asking who Simon is, it's Simon Peter. This is Peter he's talking to. He says, And Simon, Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. I want you to do me a favor at the bottom here in verse number 11. I want you to say, where it says forsook all, I want you to circle the word all there. And they followed him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. My heavenly Father, Lord, I love thee. And I thank thee for the privilege which thou hast provided unto me this day once again to stand in a pulpit and deliver truth. Not my truth, not anyone else's truth, but thy truth. And Father, I recognize that on many a churches and many pulpits today, we're relegating what is and what is not truth. I wish not to bring any matter of truth to the subject, but thine, for thine is eternally true. And Father, I pray for these marvelous people this day that have gathered in what is unseasonal weather, Father, in terms of church on Sunday morning. I thank you for their willingness to gather and to be here and be nowhere else. And Father, I would just be okay if at any moment you called your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take us all home. For I pray, Lord, that we be not absent of the element of heaven here right now in this church with this word, with thy spirit, and with this people. And Father, I pray in all things you meet us here because without you, Father, we can do nothing. And Father, I'm afraid that if we gather here to get today and your spirit is not in our midst with power and with truth, then everything that we're getting ready to try to accomplish is for nothing. And Father, I pray sincerely that you meet with us, deal with our hearts, help us to see the scriptures for what they are, and to be challenged in our life daily at the things that we ought to do for your Son, the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on flesh, come among thy people, and died and rose again for the sins of the world so that we could share the gospel, the greatest news that's ever been told, how that we, as a sinful and depraved people, have been redeemed unto thee eternally. Father, we thank thee for the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which cleanses us from all stain and all sin and all spot. And Father, I pray that we lift him up, for he's worthy. I ask all this in the name of the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ, for his sake I pray. Amen. <laughs> I think sometimes too often, and I, I love the brethren, but... There seems to be a lot of contention among brethren nowadays, and I really don't understand that. And let me try to express to you why is because when asked about my ministry, usually the first question, I was sharing this with my wife last night, is, Brother Joe, where'd you go to school at? And for those of you that have asked that question internally but have never asked me personally, the the truth of the matter is I didn't go to an institution or a Bible college. I went to the hard knocks of God's word. Amen. And he has revealed some things to me that only, as, as he even told Peter in the flesh, he said, he said uh, Peter, he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed these things but my Father which is in heaven. And thank God God's chosen this young worm to reveal some things to. And the second question I normally get is, well, how long have you been in the ministry? I've only been in the ministry now for three years. And I want to say that by saying this. This is not to impress you but to impress upon you. Everything that I am, everything that I've become, and everything that I will be is all credit and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he can take anybody in this room, and I'm afraid that's the great hesitancy of Christians nowadays, is we're not assured whether or not God can really use me for these things. I assure you that God can and he will. I do. 
I know that because if Jesus had the words of eternal life, and I know that he did, Brother Chad, John, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, had the words to pave the way for the Lord Jesus Christ to eternally speak. And John said something that I, I can never escape in the scriptures. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And you know what I found, John? That's, that's true, brother. Because the more I, I, I stay low and decrease myself, the more increase the Father of heaven receives. And that's a tremendous blessing. And I think nowadays with all of our degrees and our phylacteries and all of our accomplishments, we've never had more PhDs. And I think I, an old preacher said this, it means nothing more really now than phenomenal dud. Amen. And we've got them, they're out there. And I'm not saying they haven't served their purpose, but I really believe at this point that God's about ready to spew institutional Christianity out of his mouth. They serve their purpose, but I will, I will say this. Have you ever noticed when you all go sometimes to these churches, as my wife and I and my family went on vacation in Alabama, and there was a church right there on the island, on Dauphin, D-A-U-P-H-I-N Island, and we enjoyed our time there, but I knew that that church wasn't going to be a church that was going to feed my soul the true word of God. So we traveled about 20, about 20 minutes up the road and went to this church and pulled in. There was about three cars in the park, and I looked over at my family. I said, well, the truth must be here. And we went and had a marvelous time. And those people were tremendous to us and to the word of God's truth. And I appreciate that, of the truth of God's word. But I appreciate that. And you, you see, too often we think that if a church is large and they've got enough people and they have enough events, that we're, we're going somewhere. And I've said this before, and I feel the need to say it again. When somebody says, what do you have for my kids? Here's what we have for your children, the word of God. That was enough for Jesus in his day. Matthew 18 declares that. We're going to get there soon. That's what we have for them. I noticed in the, in the lay of the sea and age, they didn't need more vacation Bible schools and all these other things. They're great. But I do know that John F. Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I, I wonder too often if somebody's asking themselves before they join a church, what can I do for this local New Testament body of believers under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ? And we're too often asking, what can we get out of it? And that's too westernized of us. Church doesn't look the same as it used to. And God does work, as I said, in mysterious ways. But sometimes he works in the obvious ways, too. And let me express to you what I mean. We don't need more religion in America. When you look at the life of Peter, Peter prominently said some things that we look at in the scriptures and you think, man, Peter, you, you just ain't figured it out. One of the things he said was, thou shalt not wash my feet. Shall we make two tabernacles for thee? He said, Lord, I will go and die with you on the cross. It's what he said to the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter was pretty good at putting his foot in his mouth, and no wonder the Bible says Peter said without knowing what he said. He didn't, he didn't understand it. Sometimes we as Americans just start talking, and we're saying things, and we have no idea what we're generally saying. We just don't. We're just speaking to be speaking. And I heard a man of God say this recently. He said, We've got, it's about high time that we stop talking so much and let our feet catch up with what we're saying. We would do well sometimes. I know the Bible says go ye, but it also says tarry ye. Be still, the Bible says, and know that I am God. And we're so busy in this hustle and bustle age nowadays, we just won't sit still. And it's sad. The reason I'm saying all this is in context. Take your Bible back over to Luke chapter 4. I want to begin in, Luke, in verse 38. Because we assume that at the lake of Gennesaret, there is just this meeting between Jesus and Simon Peter and he, he, he has this experience with Jesus Christ for the first time, and he's up and walking. He's, I'm going to forsake all and go with thee. Look what it says here in verse 38. And he arose out of the synagogue. That's Jesus Christ. I remind you that in the chapter previously, he had gone into Nazareth and had went into the temple, and he was teaching. He took the book, the Old Testament, and read some scripture and shared some things with them, and they wanted to thrust him headlong over that, it, that he, he may die, but he went and walked right through the mist. And he gets over here. And he goes into Peter's house, and he's in, it says he's in the synagogue, and he entered to Simon's house, and Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all they that were, had been any sick, diverse diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them allowed, that word suffered means allowed them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went out into a desert place. And the people sought him and came to him and stayed him and she, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. 
for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogue of Galilee. So he goes from Galilee, and then over in verse number 1 in chapter 5, I'm taking this off, brother. that stood by, this is one of them. And he defied it again, and a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he again, he, but, uh, but he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom, of whom you speak. And the second time the cock crew, Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crow twice. Thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Now you think about the fact that Peter has just denied his Savior three times. 
And you wonder sometimes, what's the reaction of the Lord Jesus Christ in that denial? Well, I read in the scriptures when he makes that denial, the Bible says that he looked up and Jesus made eye contact with him at the judgment hall. He saw him. Scary thought to think that you've denied Jesus Christ three times and you look up at the man that's on the judgment seat, your Lord and Savior, whom you said you died with, and there he's eye to eye, face to face with the master in flesh, with God himself. And it says that he went out and wept bitterly, the Bible says. Yeah. You know what's sad? I think we as a group of people in Western Christianity, and now mind you, I'm not speaking about everybody, but I just want you to hang with me here. We need some indefinite truths today. We come to the house of God and we get real confident about the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? This is our comfort zone, isn't it, Brother Chandler? We really feel comfortable in God's house. And praise God for that. We ought to have a fellowship of unity with the brethren. We ought to feel strengthened together one with the other. But you all spend a lot more time outside of God's house than you do in here. Right. And as soon as the church there, Jesus' church was disbanded, and the Roman soldiers scattered them out, and Jesus Christ goes to the judgment hall, you begin to see the flickering light of the, of the apostles there. And Peter denies the Lord Jesus Christ three times. And then my Lord looks up and looks at him, and he wept. And sometimes you think, can God really use me? You all recognize that in the days that Jesus Christ was preaching the gospel of repentance, and he had that message, the kingdom of God, heaven is at hand, repent and believe. I do love that word repent. I know that I'm a little dogmatic on that sometimes, but it's there. It needs to be preached. Man. It needs to. Right. You don't need to tell people, come in, leave in, stay the same. No, you're something new in Christ if you get saved. Man. And there's a requirement of you to turn from your ways. That's right. what the Bible says. Lest a man repent, he shall perish. That's what the Bible says. But you look at the churches nowadays, and you see all the things that are going on. And I know that we dress nice, and we show up to church, and those things are all good and well. But I remind you that the forerunner of Jesus Christ was John the Baptist in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. There's a man clothed with camel, camel skin. He had honey in his beard, and he was eating a grasshopper salad. <laughs> that man walks in here and starts preaching the pulpit. I tell you what, our first thought's going to be, whoa, where'd this guy come from? But then he starts laying out some sincere nuggets of truth. And preaches some things that most, most pulpits would never dare touch right. because of the fear of the people. Yeah. But I tell you, John the Baptist only had one audience. That was God Almighty. And I think we would do well to remind ourselves that when we go out from among God's people, you only have one audience. That's God Almighty himself. Right, right. man. As much as we like to talk about Jesus and sing about Jesus and pray to Jesus and worship Jesus and serve all these things in God's house, why is it the second that we leave, we still felt so discouraged, as Brother Willis, you were talking about this morning, we won't even hardly pass out a track to somebody and invite them to come to church. How often have we denied Jesus Christ? Somebody says, I haven't done, I haven't done it publicly. You have if God told you to lay a track down and somebody and you didn't do it. You have if God said, you better talk to somebody about me, and you don't do it, you publicly deny it. Peter really isn't far off from every one of us in this room. We're all guilty before the Lord. You see a great crowd of people in America today, in this young generation. You young people, listen to me real quick, and I have your ears. Can you imagine if you went to the airport and asked the individual that sold you the ticket if you could just taxi with the plane but never take off the ground? Okay, just, just imagine that for a second. You walk up and say, listen, I've got this ticket. I'm, I'm supposed to fly from here to here, but I don't actually want to take off of the runway. I just want a taxi, and then y'all can let me off, and I'll, I'll do it again. They're going to think you're crazy getting on and off planes before they ever leave the runway. You know what the problem nowadays is? You all assume that because you don't have a secular education in the Lord Jesus Christ or you haven't gone to a theological seminary or because you haven't gone to Bible college, God can't use you. I remind myself that John the Baptist didn't have Bible college, but he Amen. did have the Spirit of God on his life. Amen. And I know on many of occasions, and I've heard a man preaching the fact that John Wesley may have been one of the, great, one of the, one of the greatest qualified preachers of all time, but he'd never take off. You just need to go for him. My wife and I were talking last night about experience and education. I went to school and they told me, they said, listen, you're going to go to school, you're going to get your degree, so when you go out and, and you interview for jobs, that's going to put you in the leg up. Then I go out and I start interviewing for jobs and they say, we're going to go with this candidate because they have more. Hey, that's it, brother. How'd you know that? He's in college. They are teaching him a thing or two. <laughs> more experience. I don't think anything outweighs the fact of experience inside God's Word. That's right. Amen. And God's sitting around wondering, Am I, will, will you let me use you? Young people, listen to me. If God's dealing with you about being used, stop, stop looking at me and thinking I've got it all figured out. I don't. 
I may get up here and speak well, but you get around me in my house, my wife will tell you, Joe, you don't make a lick of sense when you talk. <laughs> <laughs> you may think I have things all organized, but you ought to see me when I run around the house trying to figure things out today. Y'all should have seen me last night trying to figure out a, a aluminum handrail at my home. It took me four hours to get the thing up. <laughs> Told my wife, I, I walked in that pound, I looked like John. I said, I'm done. <laughs> she said, you're hungry? I said, yeah, what's, what's for supper? <laughs> We get too frustrated. Somebody says, where are those young people coming out of seminary? Listen, just because they're coming out of seminary doesn't mean they're very successful. Have y'all noticed some things? I'm, listen, I'm not putting these, these areas down. Don't get me wrong. They're needed in some places. But have you ever noticed that this individual has gone to seminary and has just an eclectic and I mean, a great litany of, of books and awards and diplomas that just array his entire office? And he can't hardly get up there and preach a message that'll move you. Y'all heard about that man that went to that meeting? And he said, man, I really thought that. He said, Lord, he went home and prayed. He said, Lord, he said, I, I, it just was a wonderful message. It was, it was a great time. We had a wonderful time. He said, Lord, you, you, you ought to have been there. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder how long we're so, trying so desperately to synthesize the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's either synthetic or it is authentic. It's nowhere in between. Right. Right. Nothing worse and an actual revival is a fake revival. And you have to understand revival and understand what I mean. If you all really understood what revival meant, your prayer wouldn't be, Lord, send it to you. Lord, keep it far from us. And it goes back to that forsaking all and the word repent. Two things you don't hear preached on much often anymore. Right. And it's not because we have less worldliness in, in today. I heard a man of God say this. They won't talk about worldliness much more. They use the word secularism because it lets the man of God off the hook. Nobody knows what that means. It means worldliness. And it needs to be preached on. Right, right. John preached on it. Jesus preached on it. His disciples preached on it. And too often we think, is God able to use me? Can God really take a man that's denied Jesus Christ three times to his face, blundered throughout the three years of ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ has had on earth, and use him to preach a great message? Well, yes, he can. Amen. And praise God for that. Amen. And I thank God for using me. I really do. I am nothing without Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing. The only reason I am who I am today is because of the intervention of regeneration by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. And we do well to give that great credit to him. I'd ask if you do me a favor, turn over to Acts chapter 2. Luke 22, Jesus Christ looks at Peter and he says, Peter, he says, the, de the devil seeks to have you that he may sift you like wheat. He says, but I prayed for thee, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Jesus Christ dies, is resurrected. His ministry is about 40 days according to the book of Acts. But in Acts chapter 2, we see something happen here. This same man that just denied Jesus Christ three times that he's getting ready to be crucified does something tremendous at the day of Pentecost. And this is one of the greatest messages I think we've ever, we, we, we can read of in the Word of God. But he says here, if you look over with me, verse 15, it says, For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out on those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. You see, you can have degrees, you can have books, and you can have all these things, but if you do not have the spirit of God, your ministry is worthless. Right. It's worthless. Amen. You have to have the substance of the Spirit. Right. Look what it says down here. He begins this message in verse 22. Give in Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer that holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with my countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you. This is Paul preaching. Listen to what he's getting ready to say. Of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, 
and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to them of the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we were all witnesses. I tell you what, things didn't break loose in the ministry of Jesus Christ when it came to Calvary until in Matthew 26, 24, he said, I'm coming back. Amen. Never a man has put himself in a position. I love, I love that message in revival that Brother Travis Alcott preached. When they accused Jesus Christ of making himself the Son of God, he didn't make himself the Son of God. He always was the Son of God. Right. That's right. He made himself the Son of Man and come before us. Right. <laughs> and he took on that flesh and he said, this is if I have liberty, this is if I have power, authority, to lay my life down. Then he says this, but I also have authority to take it back up again. Right. Yeah. What man says something like that? Jesus must have been a crazy man. Who says they have the authority to lay their life down and then pick it back up? You mean to tell me you, you can honestly say that Jesus, you're going to die, you're going to give yourself to die. That sounds crazy enough. But then you're going to turn around and raise back up from the dead? That's what Peter's preaching here. Look what he says. He says, therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed for us, which we now see and hear, for David has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my right, uh, unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy fool, thy, thy foes, thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. You don't need a you don't need a difficult sermon to preach that and to make sense of it, amen. This same Jesus hath God made and ordained to die be resurrected again so that you can have life eternally. Amen. That same man who gave his life willingly nailed himself to a tree. I heard a man say this one time and it bore a great sense of truth. Jesus Christ nurtured that tree or grew that tree from its infancy and nurtured from, from babes the men who would nail him to the accursed wood. Will you think about that for a second? That deserves some time in meditation. Jesus Christ helped to bear the man from the woman that would nail him to that tree. And why would he do such a thing? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted to help redeem a nation right. and a people so that we didn't have to live in this hopeless life without hope. Right. He gave us something that no man has ever given us before. And as much as the world would like to relegate Jesus Christ as a myth and some prophet that doesn't make any sense, here we are some thousands of years later still preaching about this same man, Brother right. Armstrong, yeah. a man named Jesus Christ from Nazareth. And I wonder sometimes why, and I, I will say that sometimes in churches, we come into the house of God and we sit and we take an afternoon nap. It's kind of like a refrigerator on the corner of the street. We all get over there and we get our food and we shut it and we go on. That's about it. I heard a man say this recently. He said we talk about the, the only two works that should be completed on the Lord's Day is a work of grace and a work of mercy. It should be instituted by those two factors on God's Day. And men will come and preach the Word of God, go home and turn the television on and watch football. And it's not a work of grace and it certainly isn't a work of mercy. But unless we do it. All the while we sit around thinking, well, somebody out there is going to be doing that. No, we need a prophet to stand up and to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To declare it like John did before the nation, before Jesus Christ's ministry began. To pave the way for the Lord. And I wonder how many people are honestly looking at a crowd of folks and saying to themselves, Lord, my only audience is thee. Why is it that we sit around and wait for God to tell us, hey, it's time for you to go. And you know how many times God has told you that and you still won't get up and take off? Quit taxing on the runway. Right. Amen. We always think that God wants to do it a certain way. You know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, thank God that Peter wasn't converted to a Pharisee, amen? He was just a fisherman. But can you imagine if he had been? I heard a man say this recently. There's got to be some truth to it. I could have won some people to Christ if they're not going to local church. Jesus Christ told the Pharisees and all their phylacteries, they prayed, they tithed of all they had, they read their Bible, they fasted, they went to the Lord's house, even prayed prayers like this, thank, thank you, Father, that I'm not as those men. They'd make long prayers and pretense, and they'd go and just, just consume money from people. They would go with their traditions and tell, tell kids, give us all, all of what you've got and go home and tell your parents. It was for a gift for the church and for their sake. You know what Jesus Christ said to them? He says, harlots and publicans will go into the kingdom of God before you. Right. We don't need more religion today. 
Amen. We don't need you don't need religion. What you need are some born again Christians that have the God to be used of the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. And you Amen. don't need an education for that. You need the Spirit of God. Right. Amen. Amen. That's what you need. Yeah. Right. That's what Peter had on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. That Spirit come down and consumed that room like fire. And that great rushing, rushing wind come through. And Peter stood up and preached a message for the Lord Jesus Christ. And it meant something. Amen. But it wasn't because he went to the Pharisees' theological seminary. Right. It's not it. Yeah. Jesus Christ told those Pharisees, he said, you, you compass land and sea about to find one cross like And when you found him, you make him no more True. than twofold right. yeah. the inhabitant of hell. Think yeah. about that. Amen. You don't need religion. God help us if more church members stand up and say, I'm going to heaven because I'm in the church. No, you're not. Right. I know some Pentecostals that will get to the kingdom of heaven before some Baptists will. <laughs> Amen. That's true. You're not going to heaven because you're in a Baptist church in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, folks. There's one way you're going to get to heaven. That's through the name of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. 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 I get so tired of trying to add things to God's words. Listen, God's going to do it his own way. We wouldn't have picked Peter, but God did. You'd have thought Elijah was crazy of the prophets of Baal when he took that wood and said, let's have a contest, and then said, hey, soak the wood with water. And that's the way God wanted it done. Amen. And God come down and consumed that with fire. You'd have thought Gideon was right. crazy taking those barrels and lanterns of 300 men. You thought he was just beyond crazy. You would have thought that John the, John the Baptist was crazy. You'd have assumed that David out slingshot birds out of trees when he finally came to Goliath. You'd have thought he's crazy. Saul did, the king did, he said, never left, let him go. Somebody's got to go down there, but that's the way God did it. Right. right. No. Stop expecting it to be done the way you think it should be done. Right. And just do it the way God wants it done. Amen. Just Amen. get up and take some experience from the Lord Jesus Christ and say, Lord, if you want me to go out and knock on a door today, I'm going to go knock on somebody's door. Yeah. That's Lord, right. you want me to go pass the track? I'm going to pass the track out today. We learn from experience that God Amen. wants to use that for the effectual work of the working in you. Amen. I had a chance to go to Dearborn, Indiana. I'm going to close on this a while back. and I, I looked at about 30 or 40 young people between the age of 13 and 18. And I had a marvelous time preaching to those young folks. And I preached out of 2 Timothy be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ during hardness. Some of these kids need that, that hardness. They understand some of those aspects of the scripture. But I got over there and I got to thinking about what uh, an old preacher said. He said, I never get around, around a group of people and see some young faces. We've got a lot of young faces in this room and I thank God for that. Amen. He says, but I never get around without looking at myself and thinking, Lord, may there be just some young man from the backwoods in here somewhere that has a desire to pick up the word of God and just preach and just be an example for you. May there be some young woman in this room who's got a desire just to be used of God. You're going to make mistakes along the way. That's okay. Right. That's all right. Right. Mistakes will be made, but lessons will be learned, and we can move forward for Christ Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus. So, folks, I'm going to leave you with this. For those of you that are saved and are looking to be used of God, stop taxing on the runway. You look ridiculous getting off an old plane. Just take off. Amen. That's right. D.L. Moody once said for, in one of his biographies, and it wasn't until later in life, we recognized that this, he had this one in church over there in Chicago <coughs> that the Spirit of God would just consume him. And in his biography, right at, the end of, right at the end of his life, the last few years, he says, all my life I was carrying two buckets of water. And you could go to church after church and see some of these individuals carrying water up, buffing and blowing in the face, trying to get things. You ever seen a music leader trying to get some uh, church to sing a song they don't want to sing? Yep. We're trying our, our desperately not to disciple people and get them to go out and testify about something they have nothing to testify about. Heard a man of God say this. He says, you ever try breathing out, exhaling twice, three times, and breathing in once? He also said, now I've got a river. Listen here. He said, I've got a river now that carries me. you got a river that wants to carry you. Stop carrying buckets of water. Stop straining and trying and moving and grunting and in pain, trying to get something done for Christ. Let the river carry you. Let it flow. Amen. I thank God for some of those old preachers with some of those great nuggets of truth. Amen. And I thank God for D.L. Moody that he didn't take that first example when he was preaching up there and somebody said, oh, you better quit speaking. And he went right on to shake the world here in America. Thank God for that. It doesn't matter what people think. The only audience that you have to impress and to please is God himself. And I'll tell you this, he's more impressed with people who try and fail than those that never try at all. That's right. Somebody stand to your feet, if you will. Take your blue book and turn to page 286. I got a question for you. Are you tired of trying and failing and feeling like you're defeated and you want God to help lift you up? Well, do it. If you have a desire to do something for the Lord and he's laid it on your heart, you come forward and give that up and yield it to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I want to say this to the soul that's in this room this morning that has never heard the gospel preached. Jesus Christ died as God in the flesh for the sins of this earth. Romans 5, 8 says, but God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, for that. And if you're here and you're lost and you know it, you want to take the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll tell you this, all you've got to do is lay your hand of faith on it. You just believe like a child. Matthew 18 says two things, conversion and childlike faith. That's what God's looking for. And that's what we need more of today. Our Heavenly Father, I ask all things for this invitation. Help us now, Father. Those that have already come and those that seek to come, Lord, certainly for the answers of being healed. May we just simply lay our hand of faith and neighbor in gazing at the stars. God's debt with you, you come. good. We'll accept that as information and move on. Let's accept it as truth and do something about it. Amen. Amen. What a blessing it is to be in God's house. Brother, brother uh, Ed, if you'll just close our service in a word of prayer. Brother. Lord in heaven, we do thank you for this time we can come together. And thank you for that great love that you instilled in us. Yes, Lord, call us together to worship, fellowship together. Lord, I pray you look over each and every one now as we journey our separate ways to bring us back together safely tonight. Lord, help us to better appreciate your purpose for our lives. Be committed to it. Accept the challenge, like the preacher said, not just be taxiing around on the runway, but to be busy about the Lord's business. 